Number 10, Children of the Vault. The Children of the Vault are their own race who seek to rule the world. They are neither mutants nor humans, though they did evolve from the human race. The children are part of a race that descended from humans, having been technologically evolved over the course of 6,000 years. They believe only one race should rule Earth and plan on becoming said race. One of their members, Seraphina, recently resurfaced in the Dawn of X X Men series, having escaped from Orcus, who had somehow captured her. Before Wolverine could catch her, though, she returned to the vault, where she was also seen rejoining the other children. Number 9, Phalanx. So the Phalanx are kind of complex. If you are familiar with the Phalanx, it's probably because you are familiar with the Annihilation Conquest story arc from 2007 to 2008. The Phalanx work basically to destroy matter and upload it to a hive mind of data using the techno organic virus, assimilating all organic and inorganic matter that they come across in the universe. So they're basically like the Technarchy, but the Phalanx share a collective mind where the Technarchy are individuals. The phalanx aim to absorb all matter in the universe and eventually make Managed to threaten all of Earth and mutant kind, respectively. It is only through Moira's regeneration abilities that we know the great risk this high mind tech race could pose and has posed to the X Men and all of life before in a previous one of Moira's lives. Number eight, the Supremacy. The Supremacy sought to take down and defeat the X Men in an alternate future. We learn a bit more about them in Powers of X. They were the ones behind Nimrod the Lesser and eventually Nimrod the Greater and their library of Homo sapiens and mutants alike. After years of breeding, mutants in camps to use as their slaves and hounds to fight against their own kind who had revolted, they went a step further, literally dissolving mutants in tanks of femto fluid until they were reduced to nothing but the data that comprised them. Ugh. They would then be stored in a great library where the data that their corpses provided could be used to win the war, the war against mutant kind. Eventually, the war became obsolete, however, making this whole process and the library that stored this data almost eerily useless, which is creepier. Don't put me in femto fluid, please. Number six, sword bearers of Araco. The sword bearers of Araco were the chosen sword bearing champions who fought on the side of Araco and Amenth against Krakoa in the other world tournaments. Overall, they performed very well in the contest between those two nations, even considering how bizarre some of Saturnine's challenges and competitions were. Like a fashion show. That was a thing that happened. They were led by Genesis as Annihilation and joined by Bay the Blood Moon, Death and War of the original Four Horsemen, Apocalypse and Genesis's children, Iska the Unbeaten, Genesis's sister, Pog Urpog, one of my favorites, Red Root the Forest, Solemn, Summoner, grandson to Apocalypse and Genesis, the son of war, and White Sword of the Ivory Spire. They made their first appearance in the 2020 Wolverine series in issue number six and were first referred to in Ten of Swords creation, issue number one. The group was created by Jonathan Hickman and Tinney Howard. Number five, Tarn the Uncaring. Tarn has been a major antagonist throughout the modern X books. Honestly, he's so terrifying, I think he deserves to be a villain to many different mutant supers. He's shown up in both Hellions, acting as a villain against fellow villain, who's still kind of villainous, but is supposed to be on the good side, Mr. Sinister, and his team of unlikely heroes, the Hellions. The poor, poor Hellions. I miss them. Tarn also fought against Storm, who has become regent of planet Araco, formerly known as Mars. Don't worry though, Storm beat him in combat. Storm's a badass. Even though Tarn sits on the great ring of Araco, their governing body, he still seems like he's always planning something terrible. He's basically like the Araco version of Sinister, which makes him infinitely more dangerous and overall worse. Tarn made his first appearance in the Hellions issue number six in 2020 and was created by Zeb Wells and Carmen Carnero. Number four, Nameless the Shapeshifter Queen. Well, this villain was pretty short lived, especially considering how hype she seemed. I mean, she is called the Shapeshifter Queen. She is still a pretty important villain for you to be familiar with if you are a fan of x man Storm. Storm has been doing a lot of cool stuff lately in the comics, but one of the most epic things to have come her way has been taking her seat as regent of planet Araco and becoming a queen in a sense once more. Region. Sorry, Storm. <laughs> in order for her to earn her seat among the rest of the great ring of Araco, she had to take down Nameless. The two fought to determine if Storm would take the seat, and Storm actually won the fight. She offered mercy to Nameless, but instead, the shapeshifter queen decided to use Storm's power, as she had adopted Storm's form in battle, to end her own life. Which seems to have stuck with Storm, who was caught lost in thought thinking back to that battle in X Men Red issue number one. Nameless made her first appearance in the 2021 
Sword series in issue number 8. She was created by Al Ewing and Goyo Villanova. Number 3, Horticulture. I love these ladies so much. They are basically a villainous eco-terrorist version of the Golden Girls group. They are sassy elderly women who used to work for corrupt and greedy biotech companies who did not care about the effects of their work in regards to the planet's well-being. As such, these women decided to fight back. They planted their own seeds within the companies, hoping to infiltrate them over time so that they could then have control of all plant life on Earth, deciding what grows and what doesn't. However, with Krakoa's miracle plants and resulting pharma drugs hitting the market as a result of the mutant nation being recognized globally, their plans were kind of threatened. Horticulture formed and these four women, Opal, Lily, Augusta and Edith, threatened the mutants and Krakoa. They attacked with a green sticky substance that appears to neutralize mutant powers and vowed to either cause Krakoa to join them or they would cut them down like the weed they are. I sincerely hope we get to see a lot more of them or that the mutants decide to team up with them because they're just hilarious and amazing. Number 2, Merck. Merck is a team and organization that was built out of the demilitarization that seems to have happened globally as a result of Krakoa being recognized as a nation. Call it a time of peace or call it an anxious time of reserved resources in preparation for the war to come. But regardless of the cause, Merck is comprised of former top paramilitary soldiers who seek out battle because you know they were kind of laid off and as such have become guns for hire. They are loyal to no nation. They were originally employed by Xeno to fight against the X-Force and X-Men but may have also more recently been approached by the mutants themselves in regards to their services. So I'll have to wait and see. They were fighting against them, but maybe they can be used. Number 1. Hominus Verendi While the Marauders might operate separately from the X-Men, they are still comprised of a lot of former and current X-Men members, including one of the original team members, Bobby Drake. And it also includes Storm! Yay! This team is led by Captain Kate and ends up going up against the anti-mutant organization Hominus Verendi, which is comprised of former Inner Circle members of the Hellfire Club. Sort of. Also, can we just acknowledge how great the Hellfire trading company is though. Separate of course from Herman is Verende, but still they're really cool and I just had to shout them out because yeah they're really fun. Herman is Verende were previously known as the unofficial Hellfire Brats and were originally part of the Hellfire Academy. The team also has their own White Queen, Black King and the like similar to Krakoa's Quiet Council and the former Hellfire Club. But of course they're all kids, they're all little non-mutant kids who just want to hate on mutants. Evil children, evil children. Number 10. Vanisher. An old school villain who also almost single handedly defeated the X Men back in the day. Almost. So close. Well, actually, he kind of did defeat the X Men team, but fortunately, Professor X butt in to save the day. And he was only able to defeat Vanisher by wiping his mind and making him forget who he was and what he was capable of. Which I think goes to show just how powerful of a villain he is. He was the first teleporter the team really encountered, proving just how crazy powerful teleporters are. Vanisher is also considered to be a super fast teleporter and his power limits thus far has been pretty much undefined, even when he did resurface years later. I would consider him to be at a higher level though, just based on what I've seen thus far. He also was able to teleport himself safely just instinctually, even when teleporting to a place he's never seen or been to before, avoiding teleporting partially or fully into any solid objects, which of course could kill him, and which is like a great danger if you're a teleporter. You just teleport somewhere and now part of you's in a car and you're like, well I guess I'm dead now. That's it. Number 9, Living Diamond. Okay, so someone I also think we need to talk about who needs some kind of redemption in the comics is Jack Winters, aka Jack O Diamonds or Living Diamond. He was one of the first X-Men villains whom Professor X saved Scott Summers from, thereby recruiting him to his X-Men team. Living Diamond's mutant power was believed to be radiation resistance, but he was also shown to be able to teleport short distances, had telepathy, and had a diamond form. Does that sound familiar at all? Telepathy with a diamond form. Hmm. Somehow Living Diamond was way too easily defeated by a vibration beam which shattered him. I know Living Diamond is dead now and was undead at one point, but I really feel like considering how OP Emma Frost has become, Living Diamond should also get a second chance to prove just how powerful he in theory should be. I mean if you got all that, how were you so easily defeated? And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you
you want more lists like it where we talk about the unexpected yet powerful villains that we don't usually get to talk about, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Arcade. Arcade is one of those villains who feels super ridiculous with his grandiose plans for murder world. But in reality, when he actually manages to achieve plots like murder world, he's actually quite scary. I mean, getting a sneak peek into just what a ludicrous and horrifying operation he'd run in Hellions really made me appreciate just how dangerous Arcade can be if he does manage to get enough hostages, that is, to control people into working with him so he can create his murder world. In Hellions number nine, it's revealed that the trap Mastermind walked the Hellions and prior to that Mr. Sinister into was a trap laid by Arcade himself. <gasps> Gasp, what a reveal. Arcade's plan was to use Sinister's Hellions as leverage to encourage Sinister to work for him. Sinister didn't really seem to actually care about the Hellions and he basically just agreed outright, although Arcade still chose to forcefully remove some of his teeth for fun before putting him to work. He wanted Sinister to make clones for him for Murder World and had his plan worked, it would have been a real horror show. However, Sinister made a counter offer to Mastermind and instead the two double crossed Arcade. Still, that whole like three issue arc made me believe in the power of Arcade. Like, if he has the right allies, he could be really crazy. I'm here for like some sort of plot where Arcade tries to just turn the world into murder world or something. I, if that hasn't happened yet, someone write that for me, please. Maybe I should write that down. Maybe I should write that. I don't know. Marvel, call me. I got ideas, apparently. Number seven, Orcus. Orcus is a combination of a variety of government organizations, some more noble than others. The money and structure behind Orcus has been provided by such iconic organizations as AIM, SHIELD, and STRIKE, primarily. But smaller investments belonging to organizations such as SWORD, Alpha Flight, Hammer, Armor, and even Hydra. The goal of Orcus is to protect humanity from growing global threats, which in this case involve mutants. Their plotting caused Professor X to create a task force to stop the creation of a mother mold, which he and Moira McTaggart believed would be the beginning of the end for mutants in regards to the Nimrod tech that the mother mold would produce. However, we later discovered in the new X-Men series that the work of scientist Alia Gregor, who is affiliated with Orcus, proves that this assumption may have actually been wrong, and that Nimrod tech may continue to be a threat to the X-Men even with the mother mold destroyed. Also, now Alia has got an even bigger hate on for the mutants and the X-Men after the death of her husband, which happened when the mutant team infiltrated the Orcus space station and destroyed the mother mold. Number six, Chen Zhao. Chen Zhao is a very wealthy politician. He was publicly humiliated by Kate Pride. Yeah, she's dropped Kitty and she's just going by Kate Pride now. And Bishop. She was humiliated when she attempted to blame mutants for her missing husband, who turned out had actually just joined a kind of cult of worshiping and celebrating mutants. So. That's kind of awkward for her. Frustrated, she decided to make a very generous donation to anti-mutant organizations and aims to continue her own fight in the war against mutants. She donated to one very specific anti-mutant organization actually, which we'll talk about soon. Number five, Xeno. Although the creation and unity we have seen from the mutants in the Dawn of X relaunch has allowed them to shut down those programs who would use mutants as test subjects and as a means to advance human evolution, that doesn't mean that the people behind those organizations just disappear. In fact, it seems that instead the few people left who still believe in them have found one another and created a more secretive organization in the shadows known as Xeno. Xeno was the group behind the assassination of Charles Xavier in the X-Force series. And while X was successfully resurrected, Xeno still created quite a shiver of panic among the mutants of Krakoa. This organization will likely continue to pop up as an enemy to mutants and the X-Men throughout the relaunch. And they are ruthless, resourceful, and terrifying in their methods, successfully using the captured Domino's skin to ensure their assassinations team success. Ick. Graphic. Get it? Because they graphed her skin? Uh. You. Gotta get that luck though, gotta just slap that luck skin on to ya. Number four, Apoth. Apoth is the main antagonist of the new Fallen Angel series. While Apoth doesn't directly threaten all of mutant kind or all of X-Men, although at the end there they kind of mentioned it like they would be threatening that, they definitely found a strong enemy with one member of the X-Men, Psylocke. Or well, a version of Psylocke anyways. With Braddock and Quanon both being discarded as names for her, Psylocke sets out to seek out her daughter, who had been taken from her years ago when she worked for the Hand. Yeah, apparently she has a secret daughter, that's a thing. And to find a villain called Apoth. 
Psylocke. Also, I think we can assume because of the whole hand thing that this Psylocke is Quanon, but she doesn't want us to call her Quanon, so we won't do that. It turns out that Apoth is a god who also kind of has an army of children at their disposal and that they inhabit two sides of themselves, one light, one dark. Psylocke creates a team and works with Sinister to find and defeat Apoth for her own reasons, not knowing that in fact strings have also kind of been pulled in regards to this upcoming battle and why she's going to do it. Apoth is a powerful and psychic telepathic villain, but still proves to be no no match for a Psylocke. Number three, Mystique. Mystique is someone who isn't particularly or at least outwardly powerful when it comes to what she's capable of or her power set, and for this reason, many people have taken to underestimating her abilities. Here's why we'd advise against that. Inferno, issue number four. In the newest Inferno series, it's revealed that while Mystique tried to play by Krakoa's rules, when she learned she wasn't going to get what she wanted from Magneto and Professor X, no matter what she did in the name of the mutant nation, she decided to take matters into her own hands, as Mystique so often does. Disguising herself as many different people, she was able to easily ensure that Destiny was resurrected, against the wishes of the heads of the Quiet Council. She also put into motion plans to make sure that Destiny would garner a spot on the Quiet Council. And then, she almost was successful in enacting revenge on Moira X for keeping her love, Destiny, from her. Mystique here proves that not only is her power set OP, but really that her mind and sense of cunning is what makes her so dangerous, and definitely not someone to be underestimated. Number two, Destiny. Destiny has to be one of the most underestimated villains in recent years in comics. We have seen her resurface as a considerably dangerous villain in the current X books, and I'm personally loving it. Destiny was dead for quite a few years and actually got to mostly stay dead for much of them. Her mutant power allows her to see potential futures. She can see things that might come to pass, and it seems as though the more likely the future becomes, the clearer her vision of it is. She can also see more immediate futures when in the middle of a conflict. It was because of this power and Moira's personal grudge against and fear of destiny that she remained unresurrected. But something you really shouldn't underestimate when it comes to destiny is the power of love. Mystique was already told by destiny before her death that if there came a time when mutants could be resurrected and they refused to bring her back, that Mystique should basically burn this new world to the ground. And Mystique's love of destiny gave her the motivation to basically bring Krakoa to its knees with her machinations to not only return destiny, but also put her in a position of power. Precogs and love are a powerful mix. Number one, Madeline Pryor. Of course, I have to include the Goblin Queen. Madeline Pryor is a woman who seems to easily be forgotten and shelved, which is surprising considering how great of a threat she posed in the original Inferno event. Currently in the comics, Madeline Pryor is making a comeback, returning at the end of the Hellion series after being killed as part of the comic's first arc. The Madeline Pryor that was killed was definitely feeling pretty evil and threatened to destroy the entire Hellions team before they even started. The returning Madeline, who has been resurrected by the Five, is at least putting on appearances that she's more level-headed. But in reality, it seems the dark side of her still bubbles just beneath. Madeline Pryor has threatened the entire world with her dark rituals and demon packs before, and she's a clone of Jean, so although she often gets forgotten and downplayed, she really shouldn't be considering just how dangerous and powerful she is because Jean is also that and Maddie is also that too. She has the potential at least. Often people try to downplay Maddie because she's a sinister created clone, but that feels very unfair to me. She's also got like a spark of the phoenix force in her, so should that count for something? I think so. Number eight, Pale Girl. The Pale Girl was one of the first villains we'd come up against in the current newest run of Wolverine. That is volume seven overall of the Wolverine series, the 2020 series, what I'm talking about here. I can't believe it's been over two years since this series started. That is madness to me. The Pale Lady was initially believed to be a hallucination brought on by drugs, but was later revealed to be herself a mutant, Meredith Millie, whose powers allowed her to control the minds of others. It was also revealed that she was the one behind the flower cartel, which was illegally transporting and selling a powerful drug made from the pollen of Krakoan flowers. The Pale Girl first made her appearance in the 2020 Wolverine series in issue number one. She was created by Benjamin Percy and Adam Kubert. Number seven, The Blob. 
The Blob is a villain that we don't often get to talk about on these supervillain lists. He tends to fall by the wayside, but truly he's pretty unstoppable. And when he puts his mind to something, or when he puts his body to something, he's a terribly tough villain to defeat, or even move. The Blob was one of the first villains to appear in the original X-Men series, and when he did, he gave the team of youngsters a really tough time. He also attacked them with a circus. The Blob actually didn't start out as a villain, but became one due to the influence of Professor X and the X-Men themselves. Also just thinking back and like the amount of times that the X-Men have fought circuses or been trapped in circuses or that happens a lot. That's like a recurring theme. Initially, the X-Men attempted to recruit the Blob, but after the Blob refused to accept their offer, he managed to escape before Xavier could wipe his mind of their identities. This caused problems later on down the road, but really it was how the X-Men treated him after he refused to join and kind of his own self-esteem and then later his overcompensating sense of superiority that turned him into a villain. I like I wonder if the Blob actually could have been an ally if this whole scenario had just gone a little bit differently. The Blob is super strong, durable, and virtually immovable thanks to his ability to manipulate gravitational mass, which is pretty powerful. He also later gained a secondary mutation which gave him a liquid form, but he hasn't really exhibited a ton of control with his secondary power set. But he also has liquid form. That's on the resume of powers now. Number 6, Red Death. Also known as Kandra, Red Death currently has a very Scarlet Witch looking vibe going on, and I gotta say, I'm feeling it. And just like Scarlet Witch, she is not someone who you should underestimate. Kendra is part of the externals, and while she isn't one of the most memorable of that mutant villain team, she's still someone who is super powerful. Technically, just being an external comes with a pretty big dose of power. The externals, not to be confused with Marvel's Eternals, a different team entirely, are a group of immortal mutants, basically. They have had various roles throughout history. One more prominent one that folks might remember Kendra from is her role as benefactress. When we learned of her history with Gambit and the Thieves and Assassins guilds of New Orleans during Gambit's miniseries. In fact, that was actually where Kandra first was introduced in the comics, making her initial appearance in Gambit issue number one from the 1993 miniseries. Although the way they approach that introduction, you wouldn't necessarily maybe know that that was her first appearance because she kind of shows up like, hey, you know me, I'm Kandra. And I'm like, do we know you? Who are you? But it's all right, she's pretty powerful. Number five, Moira X. Moira was at one point powerful enough to have almost successfully wiped out all mutants. If it weren't for Mystique and Destiny, she would have succeeded. Even though she claimed during that past life that she only intended to create a cure to offer it to those who wanted it, Destiny knew that any mutant cure would essentially become weaponized and then forced on mutants, regardless of their own wants and desires. For those who haven't been reading along recently with the event of the current X-Men line of comics, it was revealed that Moira herself was actually a mutant whose powers were basically reincarnation in her own form. Basically, she dies and then she comes back to life as like a baby and lives her life again. But when Moira dies, she ends up being reborn as herself, but with all the memories of that past life. As such, Moira wasn't just a dangerous potential villain for the X-Men, but kind of the whole of 616, which also seems to be tied to Moira's current life, which I believe is her 10th life. Pretty crazy stuff. Moira is no longer a mutant after being cured in the 2021 Inferno series when Mystique shot her with a gun of Forge's design, which basically turns mutants into humans. But she still is a dangerous woman with a lot of information. And it was heavily implied that the creation of Krakoa was kind of all about eventually ridding the world of mutants over time, with Krakoa being like their last hurrah in terms of Moira's plan. Time will tell if Moira becomes more villainous, but I wouldn't be surprised if she did, just based on where she was heading in this story. And when or if that does happen, you better watch out. Danger is the Danger Room. The Danger Room is a villain who surfaced because they were basically being mistreated by Professor Rex, who had decided to ignore the fact that the training room had become sentient and was itself a technologically based mutant. Eventually, Danger decided, enough of this sh it's time to get some sweet, sweet revenge. The crazy thing about Danger is although we don't think of her too much, she really would be a pretty strong opponent to the X-Men considering she trained them and as such would know their strengths and weaknesses. In fact, I think that even is mentioned in the comics at one point. She was also considered to be an extinction level threat that caused Steve Rogers great worry in Heroic Age X-Men, which is kind of like a glimpse into his like tactical commentary diary. So if you wanted to read that, it exists. So despite not thinking about Danger too much, we all probably should in case she ever decides to, you know, go the villain route again. Destroy everyone, because she could probably do that. Extinction level, friends. Number three, Severe Blackmore. 
Sevier Blackmore is a new villain who recently appeared in Wolverine. He becomes an enemy to Logan after Wolverine tracks him down to learn more about Solemn. Solemn is believed to have stolen Wolverine's Muramasa blade, which is why Wolverine's trying to track him down. Wolverine and Solemn seemingly team up to take down Sevier, but instead, Solemn betrays Wolverine, giving him the slip and leaving him to face Sevier alone. Fortunately, Wolverine does beat the big Iraqi pirate and even gains possession of Blackmore's beloved and, in Emma's opinion, grotesque ship. Sevier made his first appearance in the 2020 Wolverine series in issue number 14. He was created by Benjamin Percy and Adam Kubert. Number 1. Albert Carey Albert Carey is one of the newest villains on the scene and has recently made his first appearance in the X-Force 2022 annual. Here he appears as a scientist working for Orcus. That's right, it all comes back to Orcus in the end, baby. While we don't know too much about him as he just made his first appearance, he did go up against Wolverine, Domino, and Quentin Quire's Kid Omega. His plan was to do a short burst of tests on the captured mutants after luring them into a trap. He planned on them dying during said tests, but on keeping the data of said tests to learn from, basically. While well, they stole the motherboard, which stored information for the potential devices and stratagems they were testing, Albert Carey, who seemingly ran the test, is confident that with time, they can actually rebuild what they lost, and more vital, they now actually have more information, which opens up new knowledge and possible future questions and experimentation as a result. We don't really fully know what he's up to, but he seems to be testing a new weapon, and from what we've seen of Orcus, you can bet that this is likely just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what Carrie and Orcus will have in store. I'm sure we will see him again. We'll definitely see Orcus again, that's for sure. <laughs>